Hello and welcome to Live Wire Markets. I'm Ali Selby and thanks for tuning in. Today we have a very exciting discussion for you. We're joined by Dr. Bianca Ogden, who runs Platinum's International Healthcare Fund. It's certainly an interesting time to be talking about biotech and healthcare. After all, most of Australia's population is currently still stuck in lockdowns. But with Bianca's background in virology, we'll be talking about the continued risks of COVID-19 and everything else you need to know. Plus, we'll also be discussing one or two new exciting areas of biotechnology that have recently caught Bianca's attention. Thanks so much for joining me today, Bianca. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. First up, as we mentioned before, you have a very different background to most fund managers. You started off with a PhD in virology and then started your career as a scientist. Do you believe this gives you a leg up over the competition? Um, I think I, I do believe so. But um, yeah, look, if you're a scientist, it's, it's interesting because you always um, you're used to failure. So most of your experiments tend not to work. So you're always looking for how can I do something different? How can I improve in what I have done? And it's no different to when you're an investor, particularly in this field, because things change quite often and you, you kind of have to adapt. And one of the things I think that I've learned over the years is that scientists are very fact driven so we try and keep the emotions out of it so you always look at it so or why did that not work or what's happening here and how could that change in the future and I think one of the key things in biotech that that people some some people basically just look at oh what you know what's the next catalyst and how can I invest in that that's kind of what I don't really do to me it's much more important to look at what is changing in the next decade or in the next five years and really understand, you know, what are the key themes in that and how can we invest alongside with that. And as a scientist, that's what you do all the time. So when I was in the lab, I basically looked at um, HIV and, and looked at new protease inhibitors for HIV. And it was all about predicting what mutations can happen and how would that affect the structure of it. So you constantly had to think about it. If I try this, what happens then? And that's a similar thing in, in um, biotech where you have to understand, you know, not today the standard of care. It's all about what happens when this particular company produces the drug and then it comes onto um, the market. The, the standard of care will be quite different. So you need to constantly think about what happens in the future. And I think as a scientist, you, you're very well prepared for that. And um, you don't just really treat companies like spreadsheets. You, you really look at like, like at everything that happens there. So I do think it gives, gives me quite a good base to really build upon. Okay, let's talk about the elephant in the room, COVID-19. It's the reason why we're shooting over Zoom today. Do you think the market is overestimating or underestimating the risk of COVID-19? Um, I don't know whether, I think there's a lot of people want it to be over. I think what we have to um, understand is we have to live with viruses and we have to live with this coronavirus. It is, it is not going to just um, disappear and everything is back to where it was. Um, if you look at HIV, and I like to compare that quite often. Um, so when HIV emerged or AIDS, the disease, um, we had to learn to live with it then. And what we basically did is we found um, therapeutics for it. Unfortunately, we don't have, have a vaccine yet for that. But this is kind of the same what we're going through with, um, with the coronavirus or this particular coronavirus. And I think what we've seen so far was the phenomenal, um, not success, but the phenomenal um, path that these um, mRNA vaccines in particular have taken and, and helped us to, to deal with it in, in, in or buy us time really for the next generation of vaccines to come through. And I think that's what we have to look at. It's kind of a process. I know people would like to, to, to do the you know, reopening trade and, 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 and play it in, in the big themes. I rather focus on you know, what, what gets us out of this and not out of this, but what helps us to live with it. And one of the key things we're looking at is, is what therapeutics are, are basically being developed, what specific antivirals um, are being developed. And I think if you look at the timelines that are happening towards the end of this year, we will see some more data coming out of Sanofi for their protein-based um, vaccines, which could be very interesting potentially maybe gives us more longevity on immunity. And then next year, we've got other 
and companies. Um, for example, we invested in a company called Icosavax um, that comes with a, a new vaccine called viral-like particles. We will see data around that potentially again, uh, more duration. And then we see real new antiviral um, therapies come through. And I think once we get to that, that's when we really will see a, a real change happening. So uh, I think we, we need all of these kind of weaponry to really um, kind of make it into a, a bad flu really as it is. I think the first generation of vaccines is really helping us, but I think next year it will be even more interesting in what's happening. So um, I don't really like to look at these big macro trends. I rather look at the companies and, and what, I, what do they have to offer that really help us um, treat the disease, for example. I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier. It's the, the idea of this reopening. Yeah. A lot of managers that I've spoken to recently are really betting their entire portfolio on the reopening. But at the same time, we're seeing countries like Israel implement booster shots. So it's a third shot of the vaccine. We're only kind of getting to, you know, one shot for the population. A very, like 30% of the population has two shots. You know, how does that impact the reopening play that many portfolio managers are betting on? I think one of the things that, that really happened, and you have to step back when we started developing these vaccines, I think in many ways, it probably would have been the best solution to have three shots. Um, but because there was a, obviously supply and demand, which we still have in, in parts of the world, that we settled on two, two shots. So I'm not surprised that some patients, some not patients, some, um, some humans will need a, a booster shot if they're, for example, elderly and the immune system wanes a little bit, or people that have, um, have other illnesses that, that really affects their immune system. So I think we will see that. But what is more concerning to me, um, so when you watch um, the US at the moment, or, or Germany in particular, that I watch very closely is, they have hit something like a, a vaccination fatigue where they hit a certain number of people being vaccinated, but then because the severity of the disease isn't there, people don't really want to get vaccinated, not even the first shot. And that's a serious problem going into um, the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. And if you, I follow uh, one of the virologists, Drosten, in, in Germany quite closely. And he's now said that is one of the key things they want to see is this get people have to actually get their first shot. So while boosters are good, the problem we will have is to get actually boosters to everyone because the people that are don't want to get vaccinated or haven't been vaccinated, um, they're not going to be very excited about a third shot because they haven't even had their first shot. The real issue is, which, which we should watch closely, is this, vac I call it vaccination fatigue in some of the countries. Yeah, reopening, um, look, um, I have a little bit of a suspicion there may be some lockdowns in, in the Northern Hemisphere, um, and, uh, but I think that will be temporary, but I, I don't think we're over, out of the woods yet. Let's move on to some more interesting areas of bio um, biotechnology that you are currently investigating. You've previously stated that we are at the infancy of a very exciting convergence between computer science and molecular biology. How do you see this defining the next de decade in healthcare? I think it's very exciting and we're really at the start of, of, of what's happening there. And I think you, you kind of have to look back. So what happened in the last kind of 10 years in, 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 in biotech in particular, they essentially the tools that people use in the lab have become much, much better to really drill down deeply into, into cells and understand the pathology of what's going on in diseases. But what that also meant is that we were generating a lot of data. And even if you look at, so 20 years ago, we got the, the map of the human genome. Then soon after, we, we were able to develop something called next generation sequencing, which makes reading the DNA code much easier and cheaper. And so all of this data that, that sits somewhere has to be analyzed. And one of the things when we then look at computer science is what happened there is essentially you have, um, you can now store data much easier and then you can also analyze it much easier and it's cheaper. And what that has done is now that people say, okay, now we can really look at all of this data and can actually te tease things out of it. And that's what we're seeing today. But what's also important and what, what we find fascinating is now companies, um, 
company, for example, called Recursion, who sits um, in Utah, they essentially uh, have automated labs almost. So they run about um, a million um, experiments a week. And what they do is they look at cells and they put little like either genetically modify them or put certain drugs on them to change the way they look. And what we couldn't do before, so when we look with the naked eye, we can't really see those differences. But a computer and machine learning or artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it, that, that they can pick that up. And so what this company is doing basically runs these millions of experiments and then analyzes and tries and predict the cellular networks that are happening and what really is the cause of a disease and how can you change it. And so those things are only possible because of automation, but also because we have the cloud, we have machine learning, and we have that cultural mix now that they have, particularly this company and has built that over the last couple of years. So that's very exciting because it will speed up drug discovery and it will also open up for example, new chemistry. So there's a lot in medicinal chemistry being done in this space. And, um, and I believe that in the next decade, that drug discovery will change dramatically, um, which basically means it will be cheaper, costs will come down, and we will also um, become much more efficient in screening new molecules. So to me, um, there is a real change happening here, and we really want to be part of that. You're also very passionate about companies trying to find solutions for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. What do you think we can achieve over the next 10 years in this space? I think that's another area where there's really kind of a lot of change happening. And I think I always com compare it to what happened in oncology. So one of the things in, in cancer that um, has obviously emerged over the last 10 years is immune oncology, where we're basically, so we look at how is the molecular profile of the tumor, but then we're also defining, so how many immune cells are around it? Is it a hot or a cold tumor? What do we have to do to bring more of the immune system in to basically eat up this tumor? Um, and that's the same thing. So with Alzheimer's, we know that the immune system plays quite a critical role when these neurons are being um, destroyed. And so the question is, how can we define the immune system in our brain, which is slightly different? Um, so all of that is, is happening now. And we've seen probably over the last five, again, five to 10 years, we've seen companies, biotechs, particularly in the US, um, come up and really focus on those um, on those subset of neurodegeneration. So very exciting. We, we own a company um, across various of our funds called um, Centrogene. It's a German company. They, um, they're really looking at, um, it's not a diagnostic company, but they're essentially defining the genetic subsets of different um, neurodegenerative diseases. And then um, phenotype these patients with mean they look at what symptoms do they have how does that correlate to the genetic makeup that they have of of their degenerative disease and they have built this database that they're now using to um, find new drug targets but also to work with um, with drug developers to recruit patients globally much quicker because they're then much more defined and they can find them so we are very excited by, by these areas because it really um, is something that, that is kind of in its infancy again. And um, so we're looking for other opportunities in there, but it's, look, it's, it's not an easy area, but it is a really, I think, important because um, there aren't many options for, for patients. There's a fabulous documentary on Netflix, which I would really recommend to all our viewers and readers today. It's called Unnatural Selection. It talks about CRISPR and gene drive and their potential to solve degenerative diseases and wipe out vermin. These technologies are still quite expensive and can be quite risky. Bianca, how do you see these technologies changing over the next decade? And how is this industry going to expand or explode? I'm really interested to see what you think. Yeah, look, I think there's there's fascinating shows on um, on Netflix. That one is a good one. There's another one which is a more drama called Biohackers, um, all going in the idea that you know you've got this gene editing technology, CRISPR, very quite easy to use, and you can now edit genes in and out. Um, I think it's still it's still we're still again in in its infancies. The the tool is very exciting because it made gene editing um, quite easy. So when I was in the lab many years ago um, and you had to knock out a gene, so eliminate a gene, it took you months and it was very fiddly and very annoying. 
So now you have got this gene editing, CRISPR, which is essentially an enzyme that comes in and it, it follows something called a guide RNA. And then it sits on top of this guide RNA because it shows it where it goes and then it does its cut. And it's very, quite easy to use and it very quickly um, made its way into many labs to be used as a tool. Um, so what then usually happens is they usually start as tools and then they move into the clinic and what can we do? Could we edit genes out or in? And that's kind of um, where at the moment everyone is very excited because there was a company, it was a company called Intelia that we actually had in the portfolio. They showed for the first time that if you inject this gene editing machinery, so using CRISPR and this guide RNA, they were able to um, edit out a gene and show that they can reduce the protein, which is made from the gene, um, by a lot, a lot more than actually people thought. But that's very exciting. So we are on the right track. I think what we have to look at is this enzyme called CAS. Um, how specific is it? So there's always a worry about side effects. Will it cut somewhere else? How long does it hang around? And does it just randomly cut somewhere? I think at the moment we're still early. Um, there is excitement. I think it's an absolute great tool to use in the lab. And um, we're, we have some, we're looking at some of these newer CAS molecules that are out there to understand you know, what, what's happening. But what's also, remember how I mentioned the company Recursion, they, for example, use CRISPR to edit things in and out of their cells. So they use that in a quite high throughput automated way. So there's a lot of usage on the tool side, but then on the therapeutics, it, it will, um, I think, gradually gain an, an interest. But ultimately, we have to look at the long term of the side effect. So great, great area. I think pricing will always be an issue in this space. Um, we've just seen that Europe has a very different tack to pricing of gene therapy than the US had. They're not going to tolerate that much. So um, it's interesting, each jurisdiction to its own. Are there any companies in that area that you're currently investing in? Um, we, we were in, in Intelia. So we, we bought it when it was 500 million. We sold it when it was 10 billion. Um, not that we don't like it. It's just that you basically look at the value, valuation and, and the risk reward there, really. We've got others that do other gene editing in a slightly different way. We own a company called Logic, Logic Bio in the US. So there's other ways, but it really then depends on what therapeutic you're really looking at or disease indication. Moving on to more biotechnology in Australia now, do you believe that the Australian government is doing enough to promote um, scientific discovery and innovation in Australia? I feel like we really only have a few, you know, massive biotech darlings likes of CSL or ProMedicus. You know, what is Platinum doing to really encourage biotech development in Australia? I think it, the government can do more in terms of, of, of taxes, uh, tax incentives. I think CSL could do a little bit more, really, to, to foster the local um, industry. Um, but what's interesting is that with biotechs, it doesn't stop when you give them the first kind of Series A or something. It's always you have you basically go on a journey with them and they to really make a difference. They do have to rely on long term investors to to help them really change. I would really like to see this Australia opening up a lot more to, to foreign um, venture capitalists to really, really get that money in here. And also, I think in many ways that locals, I think, should understand, you know, biotech isn't just binary. There's a lot of, um, uh, I think, money that you can make from particular long term and really going on a journey. So we, we try and selectively help and invest in companies locally, also sometimes in private rounds. Are there any unlisted Australian companies that you are currently invested in? Um, we've just actually, I think it was announced today, um, we've invested in a company called Hemologics that is developing an antibody for multiple myeloma. That we, um, they did a small race. We hope they will do one, um, a bigger one once we have some, some other data around and they can now scale up the um, production for clinical trials of their um, antibody. So very exciting. We've been speaking to them for... I think at least five years to, to really understand where it's coming. And we, we've invested in Mortimer before in a company called GenMap many years ago when they had 
an antibody which was against CD38 for multiple myeloma. People were a bit dubious about that, but this is quite a, is, is one of the lead um, therapeutics today for multiple myeloma patients. So we see quite a similar um, activity at hemologics where this antibody, anti, antibody has actually a much better safety profile and could really find its way into multiple myeloma maintenance. So very exciting um, for them to, to, to start getting into those trials. Let's talk a little bit about listed biotech. The stocks have been a little bit in the doghouse over yep. the past six months. Where are you finding opportunity at the moment? Um, I think one of the things that we do, and, and given we've been in this space for oh, almost two decades, is we really look at companies that um, we know the people, we, we, we kind of understand who's behind it, we, we, we try and, and go off the beaten track. And so we've, we've recently um, uh, have been looking a lot at, at an area called epigenomics, which um, many years ago was, was very hot. Everyone loved epigenomics. It then, as always, it all takes a little bit longer than people expect. So the heat is out of this space. And, um, and what epigenomics is, so you've got your code, your DNA code. There is a system overlaying that, which kind of regulates what genes get switched on and off. And how that's done is there's slight chemical modifications on your DNA that basically signal, oh, don't switch this gene on. And then when that chemical modification is taken away, then that gene is active. And um, so we, we basically added a company there recently that really is mapping the different regulatory parts in, in our genome. Um, it's a company called Omega Therapeutics. And interestingly, this company uses mRNA as a therapeutic to deliver the, um, the regulatory protein that then can really affect the regulation of genes. So um, it's a relatively earlier stage company, but um, we we kind of have engaged with the company, with the um, with the management there, and we really think that's quite a powerful, interesting uh, setup that they have. And they're going after a target called um, CMIC, which is very hard to target, but they have found how they can regulate this 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 protein expression, which is very exciting. Bianca, how do you identify the darlings from the duds? Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos is in the news again recently. How can investors really identify companies that may be fraudulent or duds or fakes or busts? Look, I think going, going to um, Theranos, so I, I can recommend anyone for Christmas, go and get the book um, that um, is it, I think it's Bad Blood, that is, um, is very good and it gives you a real insight in how what happens in, in, in this industry and what can go wrong. I think one of the things that I've learned is you should never rush your decision in investing in, in for example, biotechs. Um, because one, one thing is sometimes they get ahead of themselves and they rush up and you think, oh, I missed it. But I've learned that there's always a second or third time that you can invest in because there's always a stumble or always or someone get they get bored of that idea or there's no catalyst or whatever but I think in the end you really have to do your due diligence diligence and you have to um, talk to customers to actually people that use um, a technology or have worked with a company we really try and look at you know who is invested in it and can we tap into our network to see if they've met with the company um, and then in the end we, we really try and meet with different people of, of, of management to really understand you know what's going on and I think um, with Theranos in particular when you look at who was invested um, and who, who, she, who she recruited as investors, um, they're all respective in their own field, but not a lot of them were from diagnostic, from molecular diagnostic, and these parts of where we kind of know there's some really good people in there. They weren't there. And to me, that's always a red flag that, that I look for. And it's, it's um, look, it's, it's, it's kind of easy for us to say. We've done this for, for a long time, so we know who it is, but it is those things where you... You have to understand what your peers are doing and then you, you cross check and you, 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 you exchange information. And I think that's important. And again, always go to the customer. What are the factors you look out for when to know to sell a company? And is there any example that you could take us through recently with the red flags that came up that made you realize, okay, we have to sell? Often I don't fully sell out. With Intelia, I sell out because it has been an amazing performer. It is at a level where I get basically told how amazing the company is. 
And to me, that's always, I prefer when someone says to me, you're on drugs and why you're investing in this, that I prefer that. <laughs> um, so, but it's, yeah, it's in the end, selling is hard. And now what is it? A while ago, we have a company in the portfolio, Prathina, that basically a couple of years ago, a lot basically had a setback in, in, in his key um, lead antibody. It then regrouped and now it's done phenomenally. It's where you kind of know the signs are sound the people are okay. They really had a setback and they regroup. And then you over time add to it and, and, and stay with it. But, but selling is something in, in, in biotech. It's a bit hard. We, we've sold out of some of our mRNA holdings, um, again, mainly because we get it broke back to us how, how amazing mRNA is now. Um, but that doesn't mean that we stop talking to the company or learn about it and that we may come back later. We did that with um, RNA interference, which is basically the company there is a, a nylum early on when nylum came first to the market, we invested in it, then went out and then went back in when, when they had a setback. So you never really go away. It's a pretty small, small kind of environment that the biotechs are there but yeah selling is always the the hard part i, I find um I, I find that it's a bit more um more tricky to decide because you always have m a and again i've seen it many times that they all come good i have i don't see as many bankruptcies in this space what is the biggest mistake investors can make in biotechnology um sell too early i think <laughs> So that's that's kind of to me, uh, and then I get it a bit. I think most fund managers have always you never back yourself fully. At least I don't. So that's one of the things I've, I've I think I learn every year is where you um, you shouldn't be afraid that there is maybe a setback because in the end, again, if 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 the management is sound, if this if the approach is sound, they they do come back. Um, but yeah, it's often with me, it's, it's you don't wait it fully. In hindsight, it's always easy to say, oh, I should have had more. But it's the same way. Sometimes you're actually very happy because something explodes and you're like, oh, I'm glad I didn't have that much yet. And then you go back in. So I think it's a constant learning um, uh, exercise. And again, as a scientist, that's the fun part because you, you never stop wanting to learn, wanting to take on something else. And I think the biggest mistake some people make is, um, you, I think you're initially naturally always a bit hesitant about new things. Um, and I go back to the mRNA for us, like when we basically looked at that, at that and started to invest in it five years ago, we, everyone said to us, that's never worked. Like, what are you talking about? This is just like really not interested, but you have to have an open mindset and you have to think about, but what if, and I think that's, that sometimes holds people back because they cannot imagine something to actually work but it is that you have to be open to to listen to the companies and to actually listen to what they've done in the lab and and really let it explain to you and really talk to them properly so yeah it's it's the mistake is always don't be too closed to to new ideas um really embrace them and and and, and really think about what if they actually write what would that mean well, thank you so much, Bianca. It's been such an amazing conversation with you today. Thank you again. No worries. Thank you.